Hello, I'm Rosie Surdyville. I'm a local historian and tonight I'd like to talk to you about events in Gateshead in the late 18th through to the mid 19th century, the period of the campaign against the slave trade. This lecture is called Death in the Pot. It's the title of a pamphlet produced by a campaigner in Newcastle in 1850. But it's also the title of an article in a very interesting lecture given by my colleague Liz, Liz O'Donnell, who did some very interesting work on what we now call ethical consumerism, which is very much a part of the approach taken by the people I'm going to be talking to you about. In this lecture, I want to look at the way that Gateshead became involved in the slave trade um, through the accumulation of wealth via sugar produced in the East Indies, and also to talk about those people who opposed the trade and who campaigned for so long to free people caught in slavery. Um, in particular, I want to talk about those Gateshead women who were most active in our area. Very often, Gateshead gets written out of the picture when we talk about the abolitionists because we tend to talk about the Newcastle and Gateshead societies. But actually, there is a fair amount of evidence that there were many, many women living in Gateshead who were active in the, all of those societies throughout the 19th century. Many of those leading abolitionist women in the Northeast were Quakers, and there is a very good reason why Quakers were at the forefront of the anti-slavery campaigns. Because the Friends Meeting House was in Newcastle, and because many local Quakers lived in Newcastle, the assumption was that the campaigns were also Newcastle based. But actually, Northeast Quakerism started out in Gateshead, and it retained a substantial Quaker community for a good 400 years. Famous local figures such as the Dodds sisters who founded the Little Theatre came from that community and were very good examples of the kind of radical and campaigning stance that it created in its members. The Dodds sisters were the grandchildren of two particularly famous abolitionists, John Mawson and his wife, Isabella Swan Mawson. Um, she was the sister of Joseph Swan of light bulb fame. Sorry, I've given you the wrong name. It was Elizabeth Swan. Quakers of the region were often related to each other. There was a high level of intermarriage because it was felt that people were failing the community if they married out you ran the risk of being shunned were you to find yourself in that position. The founder of the Society of Friends, who were called Quakers as a kind of pejorative in their early days and who would go on to actually adopt the name themselves occasionally, George Fox preached equal rights and responsibilities for men and women in terms of rel religious practice and activism. Women could and were ministers both here and in the United States. And that tradition of activism, as well as the demand that members of the Society of Friends be of use in the world, accounts for their disproportionate numbers when it comes to involvement in campaigns for social justice, as well as general charitable endeavor. Another element that is important in the development of that tradition is the history of persecution of the Quakers. It's one of the reasons why there are so many of them in the United States. Many fled there in the 17th century in order to escape persecution. The first big community in Gateshead gets established in about 1653, and it grows very rapidly alongside communities in Sunderland and South Shields. In 1686, we're told that 17 people on a list of recusants compiled by the authorities came from Gateshead. And given that that list is simply of individuals, we have to assume that a wider family membership would take the Gateshead population up into the hundreds. John Steele, in a, a biography, if you like, of the Quaker community, 
called A Historical Sketch of the Society of Friends in Scorn Called Quakers, really tells us a great deal about just how rough conditions were for them. In 1684, there is a petition to the king for relief, which noted that there were 39 County Durham Quakers, both men and women, who were currently in jail. They were almost certainly there because they had refused to take the oath of allegiance to the king. It wasn't that they were in some way disloyal or that they had a, a sort of wild Republican streak. One of the core foundational beliefs of the Society of Friends was that they should not engage in swearing, particularly swearing oaths. It meant that they were placed in an invidious position when they were required to sign the Oath of Allegiance. And it wasn't until 1695 when the concept of affirmation was introduced that that started to become less of a burden for them. Even today in modern courts, a Quaker called to give witness will affirm that they intend to tell the truth rather than taking an oath. Because they were viewed as standing outside the system, they were barred from attending university, for taking up a, a political career, for obviously going into the clergy. And there were other restrictions on everyday life as well as everyday religious practice. Take the issue of burial, for example. Very few denominations could afford or even were allowed to have their own burial grounds. And many towns only had generic dissenters grounds. It meant that large numbers of Quakers and other nonconformists would find themselves buried in Anglican grounds if there was no private cemetery nearby. And that was often a source of friction. Uh, the Anglicans very often required that anyone buried in an Anglican cemetery should be um, somebody who'd been baptised as an Anglican and that only Anglican clergy were allowed to actually perform the ceremony. Now that meant that even though there was a legal right of burial in a parish churchyard according to civil law, many nonconformists were just not in a position to take advantage of that. And that was quite a problem in Gateshead. The community had initially met at the Fountain Air Inn in Pipewell Gate. You can see some pictures of it here. Uh, that was a very small and temporary structure and within a few years they'd managed to acquire a small meeting house on the high street. That had a very small burial ground attached to it, but we know that there was swiftly pressure in numbers. There are stories of many people being buried in the gardens of relatives because they just can't get them into the cemetery. It seems to have had enough space for about 100 people, and by 1724, that was completely full. So there was a real drive to try and find somewhere else that would offer them a bit more space. The names of the people mentioned in the records of that time are familiar. We find them cropping up today amongst the community. And they're certainly the names that we see again and again in the minutes book of the abolitionist societies and other campaigning groups. Vickers, Doubleday, Harrington, Mason, Eubank, Ogden, Orton, Richardson, Bainbridge. You'll, you'll know some of them yourself. Again and again, we find them. It was 1697 when they finally managed to obtain space on the Newcastle side of the river in Pilgrim Street, which at that point was relatively undeveloped and which meant that they could create a graveyard right next to the meeting house. Of course, while the meeting house may have moved across the river, the population remained in Gateshead. And it's this point where we start to see what is defined as entities like the Newcastle and Gateshead Abolition Society actually incorporating probably more people from Newcastle, from Gateshead, than it did from Newcastle. That experience of difficulty and persecution had an impact on the Quakers' worldview. Because they'd been through it themselves, essentially, they were inclined to recognise how hard life could be for the outsider 
and to try and take action to change that. The other great characteristic of the Quakers during this period is their internationalism. Right from the start, ministers as well as migrants traveled back and forth from the US. And that included many women who of course could be ministers in their own right. The debate about owning slaves started amongst the Quakers quite early. By 1710, many American Quakers had freed their slaves, but there were still others who kept their holdings. We know, for example, that the Newcastle indentured servant, William Morley, who went to work uh, on a kind of personal contract for the Philadelphia Quaker, Richard Pearson, found himself in company with an African slave in the household. Northeast Quakers received regular transatlantic news and American Quakers came back to Britain to attend the yearly meetings in London, where slavery was one of the items that was up for discussion. As the Americans became more conscious of how slavery was working out in the US, of how people were treated, they started to press their British brethren to oppose the institution itself. In 1727, the yearly meeting officially disapproved of the slave trade and by doing so committed the Society of Friends to campaigning against it. It was to be a major factor in the leading role that the Society of Friends would take in the fight against slavery in the century that would follow. And we know that Quaker communities supported each other and developed each other's capacity in that campaigning. We hear, for example, in 1818 of two American women, Elizabeth Fry and Hannah Field, who come from New York and who come to visit Northeast Quakers. And we have a list of the names of the women that they've come to spend time with. Mary Oliver, Mary Sutton, Margaret Richardson, Elizabeth Proctor, Margaret Binns, and another Hannah Wilson. The names are shared on both sides of the Atlantic and it can be quite confusing. For example, many of you will have heard of the other English Elizabeth Fry who campaigned for so long against the, uh, the, um, the conditions of British prisons in the 17th, 18th century. This Hannah Field, was a great minister, according to those who heard her speak. Her memorial described her as encouraging good convincement and highlighting errors. She clearly had an impact on the Society of Friends in this area. We know of at least one released Negro slave, a man called Peter Cuffey, who became a Quaker and who had an influence on the Pease family of Darlington. We tend to associate slavery with the cotton industry and with uh, the production of tobacco because our model of slavery is now very much that of the southern part of the United States. But actually in Britain, the cash crop for which black labor was so essential was sugar produced in the West Indies. And it was that sugar that made Newcastle and Gateshead's merchants rich. Men like William Coatsworth, who had estates in the West Indies, the Atkinsons of Carr Hill, or the Turners, who all appear in the compensation registers. Those compensation registers were produced in 1837 when the British government took the decision to effectively pay the slave owners for releasing them their uh, Negro holdings, if you like. Uh, it was a vast sum of money. For example, in the census of 1841, we have a man called Wilton Turner, who at the age of 30 is living in Gateshead, where he owns, or co-owns rather, the Tyne Soap and Alcohol Works. He, his wife Marie, age 25, and their two young daughters, who are two and three, have settled in Gateshead, where their family originated, having been brought up on the um, Turner family sugar hop plantations of Jamaica. 
the family are compensated to the tune of nearly £3,000 when slavery is declared illegal in Jamaica. Uh, it has to be shared with his siblings, there are eight of them. So Wilton's share of it is only about £375. But if you think about that in terms of modern purchasing power, it's actually a significant amount. It's worth about £35,000 today. The slaves kept in the West Indies or shipped to the Americas were often branded and kept in shackles and chains forged in the Corley Ironworks in Gateshead and supplied to the Americas by Northeast owned merchant vessels. The Corley works also produced the simple hoes and axes used in the back breaking work of clearing swampland carried out by black slaves in South Carolina. There was a huge demand for sugar, cotton and tobacco. Slave labour was cheap and it kept prices down. Also, it enabled a two way trade to go on. Northeast coal would be shipped out on Northeast ships to be used in the West Indies to power the boilers that converted raw sugar cane into sugar and that finished project product would then be shipped back here for sale. For many Quaker women, it was hard to find acceptance of the idea that they should speak publicly, even though their role was acknowledged publicly when it came to the abolition campaigns. It was a perception of women's roles that was challenged by some within the community, people like Elizabeth Pease. Public speaking, though, as opposed to private organisation and to the production of pamphlets, persuasive material, newsletters, was very often divided by gender. The men would be expected to be the ones who stood up in public and did the talking. The women were kind of behind the scenes, but no less active or important because of that. Women's actions, in fact, were often more practical than they were promotional. Uh, American Quakers ran an underground railroad, for example, and were involved in raising money to run campaigns, but also to purchase the freedom of escaped slaves. And the same thing happened here. It is a group of Gateshead and Newcastle women who raised the money to free uh, Frederick Douglass and William Wells Bowne to escape slaves who have come to Britain to campaign, to act as lecturers and educators, and who are only going to be able to go back to the States to retrieve their families if they have been freed. Their owners insist on payment in full. Uh, Frederick Douglass, for example, is only freed after a very large number of women raise £150, which is a significant amount of money. These women organize petitions, they arrange these lecture and education tours, they provide accommodation, they arrange for the halls and the meeting rooms, and they mobilize substantial numbers of people. We know of at least one anti-slavery meeting organized in Newcastle, which is attended by 5,000 women from both sides of the river. Putting pressure on Parliament by raising petitions was a very effective means of publicising the, the cause as well as mobilising public opinion. And it was a good way of demonstrating how many people were concerned about the issues. And there was a whole succession of them. Um, in 1792, for example, we have a petition to Parliament agreed on by the inhabitants, inhabitants of both Newcastle and Gateshead which includes many of the Quaker communities, but draws in other people as well. The whole business was to be a very long process of gradual change with an endless series of petitions and events and persuasive mechanisms being brought to bear. There is no single campaigning group during this period. They come and go depending on what the issue is and what the activity is. And you may well get gaps between groups. You also get the changing nature of slavery itself 
and the need to respond to the legal framework around them if they're going to be effective. In 1807, the Act for the Abolition of the Slave Trade prohibited slavery within the British Empire. It didn't free the existing slaves, it simply ceased trading. In 1833, after further campaigning work, the Slavery Abolition Act made the purchase or ownership of slaves illegal in much, though not all, of the British Empire. But again, slaves were not immediately freed. Instead, a period of forced apprenticeship was imposed, which was not ended until 1838, although many of those so-called apprentices found themselves effectively tied to the plantations on which they had worked as slaves. It would take further campaigns against apprenticeship to actually start to see a change there. In 1837, the Slave Compensation Act offered slaveholders 20 million pounds as compensation for the loss of their property. That's worth about 300 billion today. It's notable that the slaves themselves were not offered any compensation at all. At this point, Britain becomes quite active in attempting to control slavery worldwide. We get naval patrols that intercept sla slave trading ships from other nations. And if they find Negroes on board, remove them and take them to a place of safety. But it is not enough to stop the slave trade in the Americas in particular, where the southern states, as well as southern American countries like Brazil, continue to operate uh, undeterred. It's not until 1865, after the American Civil War, that the uh, Constitution there is amended to free the 40,000 slaves in the United States. And the process of getting to that constitutional change is one that is supported by people here. The abolition movement swings behind the end of slavery in the up northern American states. In places like Brazil, the institution of slavery will actually continue for another decade. That capacity to respond to changes in the institution itself is part of what makes the anti-slavery campaigners so effective. They come up with some really interesting tactics, bringing people who have had experience of slavery themselves onto the campaign trail is one important means of effecting change. Today, we've grown very used to the idea that every news report will include somebody explaining how the issue, whatever it is, has affected me. It personalizes it, and in personalizing it, it makes it a story that all of us can relate to. And the abolitionists are the first group of people who spot the potential of the personal story. Uh, Aluda Equiano, a freed slave, tours Britain speaking in the northeast of England in 1792. He makes his way over to Gateshead, where again he speaks at a meeting hosted by abolitionists there. People like William Wells Brown and Frederick Douglass, who are escaped slaves, also come to Britain and are welcomed in the northeast by our local abolitionist groups and encouraged to speak about their experiences and are provided with the help and support that will enable them to ensure their families are able to be reunited with them as well. These ex-slaves provide per powerful personal stories that are highly persuasive. The women would organize more and more of this sort of lecture tour where people would talk about what it felt like, what went on, what actually happened, it was a way of persuading people of the horrors of slavery, as well as of the humanity, the sense that these are human beings just like us, that is an important part in generating social change and action. The purchase of Douglas and of Wells Brown was symptomatic of the way in which these abolitionist groups sometimes had great difficulty in agreeing with each other 
there were many different viewpoints. There's no single viewpoint any more than there is any single organisation. There were many who felt that the campaign to buy Douglas and Wells Brown, for example, was in itself an act of slavery. Buying a human being was so profoundly unacceptable that even if it was being done for the best of motives, it couldn't be contemplated. Uh, and the Newcastle women who spearheaded that campaign, Anna Richardson, her sister-in-law Ellen, and Anna's husband Henry, were viewed as being highly dubious by some people. It wasn't the only debate within abolitionism. The mid 19th century was a time of discussion about issues of free trade, often centering on issues like the Corn Laws, but also on the idea of free produce. That idea that you would make a conscious choice as a consumer to buy sugar or cotton that had been produced by free labor rather than slave labor. And you find people being involved in both aspects of the argument. This is a, a drawing of Gateshead's MP, William Hutt. He's a, a fervent free trader, one who insists that deregulation is the way to encourage trade and competition between nations, and that that competition will bring about any positive social good that you need. He actually brings a motion in 1847 before the House of Parliament calling on Britain to cease trade naval patrols to pick up uh, and slave trading ships and to release their cargo. He argues that it's a bad idea in terms of the cost to the public purse, but also that it's a form of trading regulation which will do harm to demolishing the barriers between nations. Hutt argued that the slave trade would die out naturally in the face of competition if left to itself. Attempts to replace goods produced by slaves with items originating from free labour also had an impact in terms of tariffs. The tariffs placed on slave produced goods, for example, were lower than those on goods coming from areas where free labour was in use. And there was an additional element of debate within the American reform movement that exacerbated that whole problem. In the States, there'd been a really acrimonious split in the 1840s when William Lloyd Garrison, an American journalist and abolitionist, headed up the group that felt that moral persuasion and acts of non-resistance were the means to end slavery, that taking political action, making political choices was perhaps not the best way to do it. Some viewed Garrison's followers as dangerous radicals, particularly because of their alignment with a number of radical causes, including women's rights. Uh, and of course, their association with some unconventional religious views like nonconformity. Amongst those aligned with Garrison in Britain were the Gateshead couple, Elizabeth and John Mawson. They were friends as well as allies of Garrison, that could be seen from the correspondence. Both John and Elizabeth had been active anti-slavery campaigners for many years. Elizabeth concentrating primarily on local work, John on national level. When Garrison visited Newcastle uh, for his second tour of Britain in 1867, uh, a rather triumphal event, because this was after Prince, uh, sorry, President Lincoln's emancipation of American slaves. He came to stay with the Mawsons in Gateshead, remaining there for four days. The letters between both John and Elizabeth make it clear that the relationship of the couple was very much one of equals involved in campaigning and in the abolition movement, as well as personal friendship. Uh, Elizabeth, for example, writes to uh, him in 1877, 
sharing sort of discussion about what she's reading in the newspapers, sharing political worries, but also promising to forward some of her brother's new interesting photographic proofs. The house Garrison stayed in when he visited them was Ashfield House just off Joycey Road, which was their home for many years. When Garrison came here in 1867, it was shortly before John was actually killed in a terrible accident on the town moor. He had gone there with a number of um, colleagues to try and make safe an unclaimed canister of nitroglycerin. The idea was that they would carry out a safe detonation, which went badly wrong and he was killed. Garrison wrote to Elizabeth expressing his sorrow about the event and his letter is incredibly touching. It's very clear that this is a very, very close relationship. Garrison was far less happy with the activities of the Newcastle Ladies Free Produce Society, founded by Quaker women in 1846 whose leading lights were again Anna Richardson and her sister-in-law Ellen. They rapidly gathered around them hundreds of women who felt that the best way of bringing about change was to hit the sugar barons in their pockets. Garrison argued that this was an irrelevance, frittering away great energies and respectable powers in controversies about cotton cloth and pounds of sugar. However, the strength of the attacks on Anna and her friends may have had more to do with the fear that success in building up the free produce movement in the 1850s was diverting funds from Garrison's campaigns in America. Andrew Payton, writing to Garrison in 1851, reported that the Edinburgh Ladies' Anti-Slavery Society was withholding contributions for the pro-Garrison Boston anti-slavery bazaar and recommending support for the free labor movement at the instig instigation of Anna Richardson of Newcastle, who is related to the Wiggums, we are told, another campaigning Quaker family and one who had family and intermarriage links right across the Northeast Quaker communities. Harriet Beecher Stowe, author of Uncle Tom's Carbon, comes to visit the Northeast in 1853, and she stays with members of the Richardson family. Anna takes the opportunity to publish a tract, a pamphlet, capitalizing on the popularity of Stowe's book. It's called Who Are the Slaveholders? A Moral Drawn from Uncle Tom's Cabin. British abolitionists who felt powerless to assist the American anti-slavery movement could demonstrate their continued opposition to slavery by buying free labor cotton goods or sugar. It's no coincidence that the local ladies emancipation society resolved that their efforts and I'm quoting here, at the present moment, be especially turned to encouraging the consumption of free labor produce. That was the sort of founding statement when they came back together again after a th three year lull in their activities. They were picking up on an idea that had actually been around for some time. Back in 1792, this article had appeared in the Newcastle Courant describing the experience of a reporter who had come home to find the women in their family had decided that a free produce campaign was exactly the way they wanted to go. You get the impression that maybe Humanus, whoever he was, wasn't terribly delighted to find that West Indian sugar and rum was no longer on the family table. It's one of the first evidences of anti-slavery activity by women following the establishment of a men's abolition society here in 1791. East India sugar, promoted as a non-slave alternative, is known to have been available from a grocer's in Sunderland, and they weren't slow to let people know about that. 
sugar bowls labeled East India sugar, not made by slaves. Indeed, entire tea sets were manufactured to convey the anti-slavery message. Although the 1790s campaign was relatively short lived, many people continued to abstain from sugar and other slave grown products, particularly amongst the Society of Friends, where there was a, an emphasis on a simple and almost a clean way of living, if you like, we'd call it in modern terms. Quaker parents were warned to avoid the in evil consequences from the mistaken conduct of pampering the appetite and indulging the pleasures of the palate in childhood. So there's an element of righteousness about it as well as effective political organization. Elizabeth Spence Watson, who grew up in the Richardson family and who was to marry uh, Robert Spence Watson of Gateshead, a woman who was to become an anti-slavery campaigner as well as a suffrage campaigner, recalled vividly the one occasion in her childhood where she resorted to lying to her father. She'd asked for her penny pocket money to be paid a day early. And when her father had asked her what on earth she wanted it for, she'd said, oh, nothing in particular. She was not about to prepare, she was not about to admit to planning to buy sweets, which would probably have incorporated slave grown sugar to a family that had made a decision to abjure that completely. It's kind of interesting to note that this idea of ethical consumerism is something that will come back to Gateshead almost a, a century later, when Tradecraft, an organization that's still working over there, was founded in 1979. In August 1850, an escaped slave and his family, Henry Highland Garnet from the US, was persuaded to come north and was designated the traveling agent of the Newcastle Ladies Emancipation Society, which as we've already seen includes large numbers of Gateshead women. They raised money to bring him, his wife and three young children to Britain. There was a soiree held at the Congregational School Room in Clayton Street in Newcastle, at which 400 tickets were sold at sixpence apiece. And all of that money was handed over to Garnet's wife so that she would be able to keep and sustain her family while he traveled on behalf of the Emancipation Society. He toured the north of Britain, starting with Bladen, Winlayton, and Gateshead, and then widening his, his travel route to take in the rest of the country and his job was to urge women to take it into their own hands to create a demand for free produce let there be a demand for it they argued and the demand for slave grown produce would cease to exist let the public move first and all of the great companies would be fast forced to follow they argued that Britain was the main prop and stay of American slavery at this time, commenting that if slaves sold well in America, you could be sure that the price of cotton would be high in Liverpool, the port through which it often got shipped. It was on its way, of course, to the mills and textile factories of the Northwest. And it's quite interesting to note that during the American Civil War, it is women cotton workers in places like Preston who actually refuse to handle this slave produced cotton that is being imported by the American South to support their war effort. If you're ever traveling through Preston, it's worth going and seeing the rather lovely memorial to those cotton workers who made such a stand despite the fact that it threatened their own livelihoods and the well-being of their own families. These were not middle class women with resources. These were ordinary working women who nevertheless felt that this was a moral imperative. Displays of free labour cottons, along with information on where you could buy them in, in Newcastle and Gateshead were offered. And there were all sorts of marketing suggestions provided. Commercial travelers were encouraged to display labels announcing the free produce nature of their product. 
and posters and flyers were produced telling how you could work out whether something was slave produced or free labor and where you could buy it. There is one person I wish had come to Britain during this period. She's very typical of a particular group. Most of these traveling speakers were male uh, and they tended to be escaped slaves. There are escaped women slaves living in Britain. We know, for example, of Mary Mackham at um, Robert Spencer Watson's family home in North Tyneside. Uh, we also have somebody like Mary Prince living in London who writes a book about her experiences, which is a powerful propaganda tale. But people like Frances Watkins here, who was actually freeborn, and who became famous as a, a writer and a teacher, was one of the few American women who actually traveled speaking at public meetings on issues around abolitionism and suffrage. Uh, I would just love to have heard her speak. She was a fervent supporter of the free produce movement, regularly saying that she would pay more for a free labor dress than for a slave produced one. In 1847, Anna Richardson had branched out in her writing, producing a, a document called Monthly Illustrations of American Slavery. That was a briefing document aimed at 100 newspaper editors, providing them with up to date information on slavery and slavery in the abolition campaigns, but also giving them images and what we now call merchandising opportunities, using the merchandising images that the abolitionist campaigns were coming up with. Here, you've got a set of tokens with one of the most famous sets of images of all. Uh, the text around this image of the kneeling slave says, am I not a man and a human being and a brother? Sorry, am I not a man and a brother? And on the reverse, you have two clasped hands joined together in solidarity. It's an image that we associate particularly with Josiah Wedgwood, who produced pottery tokens that showed it. But these were also turned into copper coins like these ones produced in Birmingham in about the 1790s. There was a shortage of small coins at this period. And a number of enterprising people came together to produce tokens which could function as a form of currency. These are actually half pennies. Uh, notoriously, some employers insisted on playing their workers in tokens, which could only be redeemed at the company shop. So you would have to use your wages to pay inflated prices to buy food and clothing. But these coins were designed to propagate the ideas of the anti-slavery movement in a very practical form. It would literally be the image that people would have in their pocket. It was perfectly legal to produce them. The law said that counterfeiting coins produced by the Royal Mint was a criminal offence, but creating and circulating your own was not. A woman's suffrage version of this image was produced in 1883. As you can see, it's the American Anti-Slavery Society who come up with it, and they are using the same sort of image, in this case, a kneeling female slave, and the same evocation of a shared humanity to argue for wider suffrage, as well as the freedom from slavery of the people concerned. It's an idea that is picked up again in 2007 when we were celebrating 200 years since the abolition of slavery. And this two pound coin actually shows a severed slave chain. You can just about see the, the break. I'll use my cursor to mention, show it up just here. Um, it's a bit bland in comparison to the coin, coins produced by the abolitionists. I think they actually came up with something far more gripping. But it is also quite good fun to see where else these images were shown. Gateshead was famous for its production of clay pipes. And very often clay pipes could also be used to show messages, uh, to provide entertainment, or in this case, to convey the anti-slavery message. Here again, we have the kneeling slave. 
Now, this pipe was made in Lincoln. You can tell that from the maker's initials that are on the stem. But I've used it because I can't get hold of an image of a pipe that was found in 2014 at Cholliford in Northumberland, and which had been made in Gateshead, probably made in their thousands, and was clearly designed to act as part of the anti-slavery um, campaign and is based on an image by Thomas Buick. We think that Wedgwood got his design from Buick's illustration of this document, produced in 1791 by the Newcastle Anti-Slavery Society. And it published details given to the inquiry into slavery that was conducted by the House of Commons in that year. There's another image that I would encourage you to go and, oops, gone too far, that I'd encourage you to go and take a look at. Uh, and it's, it's quite a quirky one, I like this. This is a picture of the delegates at the World Anti-Slavery Society's Convention in 1840. And it's actually a very detailed picture of real faces. Wikipedia, bless them, have come up with a template that lets you hover your cursor over each of the faces and get some detail about who they were. You'll find the link that will take you to that template at the bottom of this slide. But if you look on the right hand side, you can see what is obviously a, a Quaker lady wearing a, a very distinctive bonnet. And next to her, you can just make out the face of Anna Isabella Lady Byron who is, of course, a Northumberland personality. She was the wife of that well-known poet, Lord Byron. Um, she was a mathematician in her own right. And as you can see from her presence here, a well-known anti-slavery campaigner. Her daughter, Ada Lovelace, who was also a mathematician, is widely credited as one of the people who helped to invent the modern science of computing. So there's all sorts of nice links there to explore. I mentioned Elizabeth Spence Watson earlier, that Richardson child who sneaked off with her penny to buy illicit sweets. She was heavily involved in anti-slavery slavery and abolition campaignings, as was her husband, Robert, and in all sorts of other important and radical campaigns in our area. She was a very early women's suffrage campaigner, for example, and was deeply concerned about issues of poverty and about educational reform. We know a great deal about the way that the descendants of other Quaker women became involved in these same campaigns. I've already mentioned the Dodds sisters, who were socialists and feminist activists in their own right, the descendants of the Mawsons. Um, people like them would be very, uh, very likely to appear amongst the numbers signing the 1866 suffrage petition, which was produced in Gateshead, and which saw almost 5,000 signatures being added to those being circulated elsewhere, calling for the vote to be extended to women. I particularly like the Spence Watsons. I, I like their approach to life and I like the way that they reveal themselves so well. The day they got married, they decided that aside from sort of organizing a picnic for their friends and relatives, they would also treat the children at the ragged schools that they had both been involved in supporting. And the way that they set about that demonstrates a really good, cool knowledge of what children like and what they're going to enjoy. They organized a special breakfast for the children and they were given presents. But the really inspired touch was arranging for a couple of cannon to be set up in the schoolyard and fired off. I don't know any children who don't like the sound of explosions or fireworks going off. They arranged for rockets later in the day. It must have been a really um, lively celebration. And we're told that the children had all sorts of songs and stories that they'd written for them. They lived at Bencham Grove, um, which today is a settlement and a community centre. And that seems very appropriate. It'd been the family home for some time. Robert probably first encountered travelling campaigners like Frederick Douglass and William Wells Brown at his father's dinner table in Bencham Grove. Elizabeth 
would go on to be a key figure in the Women's Suffrage League and the Women's Franchise League here. In fact, she was a council member for the North of England Society for Women's Suffrage. And she was also very active in peace movements. She campaigned against the Boer War. And when the First World War started, she presided over the Tyneside branch of the International Arbitration and Peace Association, which was supporting um, conscientious objectors. We're told that she was very aware of the difficulties experienced by people of German extraction living in the Northeast. And indeed, on one occasion, went to the home of a German owned shop to try and protect them from an angry mob that was threatening to ransack it. Of course, she's a very elderly woman by then. It's an act of some courage. Their practical approach to the issue of slavery is very striking. There is a lovely story from September 1875 when Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli issued a circular to British ships ordering them to return any stowaway slaves to their owners. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, this is at this stage probably more applying to people traveling from Brazil than any other country. Robert was outraged and called a meeting of the Newcastle Liberal Association, which announced that if any stowaway slave were returned, he would personally indict the ship's captain for kidnapping and cite Disraeli as an accomplice. It worked. Apparently, Disraeli withdrew the circular quite quickly. It's not often that you get a glimpse inside the minds of the people that I've been talking about, but I would like to end by giving you just that. Um, Elizabeth and Robert's descendant, Ben Beck, has a marvellous website that treats his family history. Uh, and he's got some lovely materials on there, including a transcription of a journal kept by Elizabeth in the early years of her marriage. And it's absolutely lovely because she talks about the way that she's motivated. She talks about how an understanding of how hard life can be makes her aware of how much worse it be for those who are poor and about how she feels this obligation to pass on the great and happy times that she's experienced, to connect with other people. It's an incredibly human and very moving document. And it's one that brings her, I think, vividly to life. We're going to take a break now. I'll come back in a few minutes and we'll have time for a question and answer session. I'd be really interested to hear if anyone in the audience knows of other Quaker families who were involved in these movements. And of course, if you have any photographs that you could share with us, that would be lovely. I think people's images, people's words bring them to life. And it's just wonderful to be able to share that. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Heritage Hour with Gateshead Archive. Huge apologies for difficulties at the start of the talk tonight. Um, running on home Wi-Fi is not always ideal. We do, we're missing our building, we're missing events in our building, but a big thank you to our guest speaker tonight, Rosie Surdeville. Rosie is a historian, if you don't know her, which I'm sure you do. She specializes in drama, interpretation and education, as well as being a published author. And she is here with us now to answer any questions or comments you might have. Do send them with the, um, the comments button just below the video. Um, hello, Rosie. <laughs> Thank you for bearing with us. I think we've all been through those tech moments, haven't we? Things just won't work. No yeah, <laughs> I think most people will feel they've learned a huge amount tonight. Um, there was so much in there about the, the local and the national role that we played in slavery. And, and I think most people won't know about the, those really big connections between Quakerism and the abolition movement. Really striking, wasn't it? Uh, and as always, there was just more material there than you could possibly cover. I'm just going to pull up a PowerPoint screen. Bear with me just a second. Yeah. Sharing this because I've got a lovely picture to show. Oh, I'm not allowed to share, apparently. You'd have to make me able to do so. Let me correct that. I just wanted to bring up a picture of a woman called Mary Ann Mackham. 
um, which is, it sounds like a local name, doesn't it? But actually she is a, an American slave who escaped. Uh, in 1830, she managed to get herself onto a boat and she stowed away for 60 days. She hid out on the boat while it made its way to Britain. Wow, that's an achievement. Here, yeah, there you go, Rosie. get herself in touch with Robert Spence, who is a forebear of Robert Spence Watson, who brought her up to North Shields. And for seven years, this amazing freed slave lived on North Tyneside. Uh, she worked as a chambermaid for the Spences. Wow. Wasn't an active campaigner in her own right, but we've got a photograph of her. Um, taken some years later, she married a local man, uh, became Mary Ann Blythe, and l continued living in North Shields for decades. Made it to the age of about 80 something, I think. Uh, and when we last heard of her was living with her husband's family in South Benwell. But wow. I think it's amazing, the photograph. I love that face. It's a beautiful period photograph. And, and how did they, so presumably there was some sort of national network. People were kind of making touch with, with us in the far north and arriving at who knows what port elsewhere in the country. How, how did that happen, Rosie? It's the Quakers again. Okay. Um, Robert Spence was the father of another Robert Spence who was a nationally known uh, anti-slavery campaigner. And they had contacts all over the country and traveled all over the country. So Robert Spence Jr. spent a fair amount of time in London. He may well have met Mary Ann for the first time there and decided to just send her home to his parents. OK, so there were those connections going on between, yeah, between Gateshead and London, which was obviously very important. I think one of the things that struck me was that concept that ethical shopping existed Isn't over right? 200 years ago people were encouraging others not to buy slave produced products that just yeah. feels like a very recent idea but it's not it's incredible and the fact that it's organized internationally <clears throat> really staggered me you know these people are working right across the globe at a time when travel took well it took Mary Ann 60 days to get from America to Britain you can just imagine yeah, that's a, that must have been a gruelling journey. That's really scary. Yeah, I mean, particularly for a woman. She must have just yeah. felt so vulnerable. It so says something rude. about how desperate she was. Yeah, I guess the alternative was just too horrid to kind of, to yeah. imagine. Yeah, very much. Um, do we know, so if people, do we know if that kind of ethical approach, um, did it have an impact? Did companies lose money or, or did others benefit from um, from being more ethical? The, the jury's out on that one. Some okay. historians think it wasn't particularly effective. Others think that actually the sheer number of people that it mobilised around the issue <coughs> is worthwhile because anybody who saw a teapot with one of those designs on it or who got a leaflet explaining why you should shop here rather than there is going to be getting some information about what the situation is, why people think that way. Uh, but certainly the indications are that at least 100,000 people were involved in that movement. Wow. And the size of the population at the time, that's significant. That's really significant. It is. So I guess, yeah, it's the social media of the day that you would <laughs> yeah. go shopping and yeah. good advert. Yeah. Um, we have some comments coming in. Yeah, we have one from Jason who says um, the image of uh, the the I am not a man and, and a brother, that famous image. Yeah. Um, kneeling on one knee reminds him of, of, of the current kind of um, taking the knee movement in American yes. football and elsewhere. Yes, yes. And that's not a, an analogy that would have been lost on these campaigners. It's really interesting if you look up, let me see if I've got it. Oh, it's gone the wrong way. If you look at the likes of Frederick Douglass or William Wells Brown, once the anti-slavery argument is won in the States, they start campaigning around equality issues. Um, and they're, they're talking about extending the vote to working people, including working black people. But they're also talking about women's suffrage. Okay. The idea that this is a universal problem and it has to be tackled by every element of society. 
and that just banishing slavery isn't enough to get rid of racism or inequality. Wow, because so, we sort of think of female suffrage as a bit more recent, but mm. it really sounds like the abolition movement led directly into that campaign for, for, for female suffrage and other human rights. Or, I mean, maybe it would have happened anyway, but it certainly galvanised a lot of people to think right. about people's rights. Yeah. And, and how brave were those female cotton workers who just refused yeah. to work with, with slave-produced cotton? That must yeah. have been really put in their livelihood on the line absolutely i mean they, they were low paid and in, in oh, yeah. to start with you know that is about um, making an ethical choice uh when it's not easy for you but it's Very quite great. interesting to see how that worked out locally as well because at the same time that you've got the anti-slavery movement growing you've got what would become known as the chartist movement the reform mm. movement and an awful lot of the women workers in places like Wynne Layton, who were working in, and I'll get the name wrong, the Crowley Ironworks. Yeah, Crow Ambrose Crowley. Yeah. yeah, they're quite radical. They become involved in those campaigns. So you've got women very early on in the 19th century who are talking about universal suffrage and who will also go on to argue the, for women's suffrage as that starts to work through. Wow, so it had a real multiplier effect. <laughs> yeah. um, we do have a question coming in. Is there any evidence about what Frederick Douglass thought um, about his freedom being bought? Uh, he was absolutely delighted. Okay. Uh, a lot of information about Douglass. He, he was a writer, he was a journalist. Um, and he recorded his views. He had a whole series of article books and boxes as well as diaries. And we know a lot about how grateful he was to the women who had purchased his freedom and how angry he was at both the slave system and his ex-owner who had made it impossible for him to function. In particular, he, he wrote to him, um, it's after the emancipation, and he writes to him to say, the worst thing you did was you denied me and my family an education. You know, oh, he correctly. takes it personally and he responds personally. And what period was that, Rosie, then, when Frederick Douglass was? Right, that's... Um, about... Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, it's OK, it's about, the 18... it's about 1875. OK. Yeah, so it's quite a long time after this ought to be over. Yeah, mm. because it's still going on in America. Absolutely. Um, for quite a long time after yeah. the West and Indies. What, yeah, what's going on there now has its roots squarely in that period after the American Civil War um, and in the period when what would become known as Ku Klux Klan is getting going and it's massive immediately after the Civil War. It's okay. really, really very violent. And Douglas is one of the people who is campaigning against that. Wow, very brave man. Yeah. Um, I'm just having a look for some more comments. Ah, yeah, we have um, after freedom when ex-slaves were still working under terrible conditions, so they were pretty much just very low paid, poorly treated workers, did campaigners continue to advocate for their welfare? Yes, um, you've got two, two periods of freedom there. Uh, in 1833, I think, what happens in Britain and in Britain's colonies is a system of something called apprenticeships. Basically, what they say is that you are now technically free, but you're gonna stay with the person who owned you. They're not under obligation to pay you. This is your training period, ready to equip you for freedom. So effectively, they're still tied in place and it'll take some years for that to go. But you've then also got the period after the American Civil War, when, as you, you're quite right, very poorly paid blacks working in apparently free uh, contractual relationships are actually paid less than their white equivalent and often have to battle it out with the emerging white trade unions who don't take equality all that seriously. You know, so they move from sort of one sort of phase of struggle to another. Yeah, very challenging, I imagine, and lots of um, people people vying for very similar jobs, which doesn't create for a very, um, yeah, stable society, really. It's just yeah. all happening all at once. Yeah. Um, let's have a look. I don't think we've got any more comments. 
I do have to say we will now be on the search for a Gateshead clay pipe <laughs> with the um, abolition oh. emblem on. There must be one out there somewhere. Have a look, people, if you can I if don't you know dig them up out of your garden like we do. Or yeah. we have yeah, some at the library. Be... I will have a look through them. Oh, that would be great, wouldn't it? If you actually yeah. It'd be wonderful to get it on display. I'm sure we could dig one up somewhere, hopefully. Okay, I can't see any more comments coming in, Rosie. So um, do you feel that's a good po point to kind of bring this to an end? I've got one quirky image yes. for you before we go. Be and I'll you get home and get your dinner. <laughs> Sorry, people, <laughs> I've kept you late today. Yeah. Um, this is from an 1807 Lancaster paper. And it's about sailors who are serving in other, uh, other countries' navies. Um, probably France, because we're still in the middle of a war with France at this stage. And um, Basically, a royal proclamation is issued saying that if you're on one of these foreign ships and you get captured by the Bar Barbary pirates, you will be sold into slavery and we will not make any effort to get you back. Wow. And it just gives you an idea of how widespread the concept of slavery was and how it could affect anybody if they were unlucky. You know, there was no real protection from this situation. Yeah, I guess no safety at sea or... Exactly. Quite limiting about where you could go and movement still, even though you might be free. Um, yeah, exactly. That's quite scary. A huge thank you, Rosie. Thank you to everyone thank for you. joining us. That's really been an eye-opening talk. We've all learned so much. Um, do join us next week, hopefully without the technical difficulties, when John Sadler looks at poetry of the First World War in a dramatised talk. We, we've missed the costumes, John. It's time to bring them back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's Go been on. a long year without, uh, without dress up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Rosie. And stay safe. And good night from Gateshead Archive. Good night, everyone. Good night.